is a ceremony. And with ceremonies come purpose. They are intended to reflect particular clarity, specificity, a beginning, or an ending. The opening pitch, a graduation, a wedding, the opening ceremony of the Olympics, a confirmation, a commission, an installation, a dedication, a conversion, an induction, a baptism, a funeral, a parting at the plaza, a commencement, a convocation. All different ways of saying that this group of people have gathered at this moment for this purpose and our intent is clear. The raising of the conductor's baton does not leave the orchestra wondering what to do. The ceremonial first pitch in a baseball game does not leave us wondering why we are sitting in the stadium. The starting whistle for a soccer or volleyball match does not happen at a tennis match. In a wedding, you are not kind of, sort of, maybe getting married. Coach Riggleman's induction into the American Baseball Coaches Hall of Fame was not for his fly fishing expertise, and a convocation is not a time where we ask if we should start studying and teaching. This celebration is a trumpet blast, the clarion call, the lighting of the Olympic cauldron. It's the opening tip-off, the firing of the starter's pistol. The ladies and gentlemen, start your academic engines. The time has come to study hard, to teach well, to engage the pursuit of knowledge and understanding, to honor Jesus Christ in the process, and to be reminded that we cannot impart what we do not possess to a world in which everything nailed down seems to be coming loose and the things that people said could not happen are happening. So in case you're wondering what we're doing here this morning, welcome to the 143rd Convocation of Spring Arbor University. <laughs> Following convocation, you're invited to enjoy some ice cream in the lobby of the Student Center provided by the CP Federal Credit Union. And we'd like to welcome the retired SAU employees who are here celebrating this morning. Emeriti faculty and retired staff, would you please stand and be recognized? <laughs> and we'd also like to recognize the university trustees who are joining us here this morning. Would you please stand? Dr. Kimberly Rupert, our university provost, will now introduce the new faculty for this year, and then the program will proceed without announcement until the introduction of our speaker. It's a great privilege to introduce to the Spring Arbor University community our two new full-time faculty members. Colleagues, when your name is called, please stand so that you can be acknowledged. Mr. Kurt Hoffman, Assistant Professor of Social Work. Ms. Brianne Witt, Lecturer in Art. <laughs> Welcome. May the God of hope fill you with the joy of new beginnings. For Christ is risen, he is risen indeed. As a community of learners proclaiming the risen Lord, we rejoice in this new academic year. We thank you, blessed Trinity, for your gifts of creation, forgiveness, redemption, and growth. O oh, Father, life of all life, God of laughter, way of freedom, our beginning, inspire us as we guide, encourage, and nurture our students. O oh, Son, loving maker, gatherer of the lost, love of all loves, joy and sorrow, word of mercy, walk beside us in our studies. O Spirit, who prefers the upright heart and pure, inspire us, you who were present from the first. What is dark in us, illuminate. What is low, raise and support. We, your students, shall ardently seek wisdom. We, your faculty, shall humbly lead you toward wisdom. We, your students, pledge ourselves to academic honesty, to respect interactions with others, and to diligently work our honors Christ. We, your faculty, pledge ourselves to academic rigor, to respectful interaction with others, and to diligent work that honors Christ. 
as we present ourselves a living sacrifice. May we be transformed by the renewing of our minds so that we can cultivate goodness in the world to God. God. As we endeavor to guide you in virtue, to lead you into studiousness, humility, justice, thoughtfulness, fidelity, honesty, and love, may the Lord bless our efforts. Amen. Amen. Today's scripture passage will be read from the Heritage Edition of the St. John's Bible, the first handwritten illuminated manuscript of the Bible to be commissioned in 500 years. We are fortunate to have this volume on campus for this academic year as part of our focus series, and it is on display in the entryway of the White Library. This reading is from John 1, 1 through 5 and 14. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and without him, not one thing came into being. What has come into being in him was life, and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. And the Word became flesh and lived among us, and we have seen his glory, the glory as of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. Good morning. It's a privilege to have you here today, to be gathered in this location at this time for the purpose of beginning yet another academic year. For those of you who are new to our community, you're beginning to get a taste of what it means when we lift up the Spring Arbor University concept as the hallmark of the purpose and the orientation of our educational endeavors and our desire for you to mature and to grow into men and women who serve as strong ambassadors of Christ, regardless of where he leads you in the future. And when you think about the closing line of our concept, in many ways the outcome of what we desire and hope that you will receive upon the culmination of your time at Spring Arbor University is that you would be critical participants in a contemporary world. Our world today has access to information like no other time in human history. There are people of, of deep and profound knowledge that use their abilities, use their credentials, use their understanding to do things in this world that are not consistent with the will and the direction of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Our hope for you is not that you would merely grow into people of knowledge, but that you would move and grow to become people of wisdom people who are able to use their knowledge and their skills, their talents, their passions, their credentials, and to see how they can fit within this world to go and be a minister of redemption and reconciliation, to be a champion of the good news of Jesus Christ. And today at our convocation, we have the privilege of hearing from a gentleman who has lived that concept beautifully well in his life, in his vocation, in his relationship with his family and his friends. He served Spring Arbor University now as a member of our Board of Trustees for 20 years. He graduated from Spring Arbor University in 1979 with a degree in chemistry. And from that time has gone on to practice law as an environmental attorney and an international legal consultant. He served as general partner with the international law firm of Squire and Sanders, working for much of his career in Saudi Arabia. Along with that work, he's worked domestically 
on a variety of cases focusing primarily on environmental matters, including state and federal litigation. His wife, Carol, who couldn't be with us today, is also a graduate, as well as his son, James, who is here, is a graduate of 2008. So would you please join me in welcoming our convocation speaker, Dale Stevenson. President Ellis, thank you for that uh, kind introduction. And to the cabinet members, fellow trustees, faculty members, students, guests, and other members of the Spring Arbor community, it's my distinct honor and pleasure to be with you here today and be given the opportunity to share a few thoughts as you begin another academic year. It's actually the 143rd consecutive academic year beginning at Spring Arbor from its uh, roots back in 1873. The Spring Arbor concept provides a very straightforward challenge. Uh, through conscious integration of faith and lifelong learning, you're to become a critical participant in the contemporary world. Now, since my beginning days at Spring Arbor 40 years ago, I've had the privilege of uh, leading a very interesting and rewarding life. From a, the pinnacle of a legal practice in the United States, uh, trying cases up as high as the United States Supreme Court and, uh, and, and, and winning when I got there, which is more, more fun than losing. Uh, <laughs> and then shifting my career almost completely to international institutional development in a uh, challenging part of the world, uh, that is the Middle East, the United Arab Emirates, Saudi Arabia, Lebanon, Iraq, Kuwait, Bahrain, Oman, Qatar, Egypt, those places uh, uh, when they were the hot place to be. Sometimes I felt a little bit like uh, Forrest Gump just popping into the picture at the right moment it was snapped and you got to see all the interesting things uh, that were going on in, in various parts of the world. So how did someone who uh, started as a small town kid in Michigan uh, end up ultimately traveling nearly two million miles to places seven, eight, nine, ten thousand miles away and getting to be a critical participant in one of the uh, emerging global spots in our world economy. Now today is September 11th. It's the 14th anniversary of the attacks that changed the world for many Americans, including me. Now, I'll tell you how that changed, but first of all, I want to give you a little background of, of who I am and how I got here. The highlights of my uh, address today are going to be uh, probably not what I should deliver in an academic institution with perhaps uh, slang colloquialisms and uh, improper grammar, but the points are going to be fess up, gear up, and man up. Uh, I've gained a good deal of experience since I uh, graduated from this institution back in the 1970s. And with the benefit of the little hindsight, I'd like to share with you what happened along the way. Now, I was from a small town. I worked on the, a family farm. I was confident in everything I did. I liked to argue, and I liked to win. Uh, I enjoyed studying and debating everything. It didn't matter if it was topical news or theological issues. I drove my older siblings crazy. Uh, I shifted to my father's adult Sunday school class when I was in the fifth grade just so I could study a week ahead of time and see if I could ask questions that would stump him. I was a pain. Uh, I was self-assured and uh, control was the hallmark of my existence. Uh, my son might tell you it's still, still a little bit of that in there. But uh, I was uncomfortable letting God be God. I understood Christianity. I understood the concepts of sin and confession. I just didn't think it really applied to me that much. I tried to do things pretty well. I wasn't that bad. Uh, I read the Old Testament versions of confession and sin. Oh, when you're guilty, you must confess in the ways that you've sinned. And you know, I thought, well, I could have done better, but it wasn't that bad. And I got to Spring Arbor. And it was time to fess up. Uh, now, fess up's a, a kind of an urban term. Uh, <laughs> It means to admit or acknowledge a wrongdoing, an error or shortcoming. It dates back to the early 1900s, actually. 
and even our, our good president upon his first election to office in his, his uh, president-elect press conference said, you know, one of the things I, I hope is that the American people will find when we make a mistake, we're willing to fess up and change. Direct quote. Uh, I think we might need a little more fessing up in, in Washington these days, but uh, I, actually I'd like to remind him of that quote. Uh, well, during my first year in Spring Arbor, I discovered that even when I controlled everything, I still hurt the people around me. I wasn't a very good listener. I wasn't sensitive to the needs of others. I wanted to dictate the right answer. I had a quick tongue, barbed comments. Uh, cutting humor was used if necessary. And I came to understand that when I was retaining control and limiting God to a manageable size, that was the very definition of idolatry. Remember the temptation of the ser serpent in the garden? Do you desire to be as God, knowing good and evil? I kind of liked the job description God had and wanted a little piece of it, so I just made him a little more manageable. Well, I gave that up. I recognized my own incompleteness and inadequacy without God. I confessed that that command and control approach I'd been taking to life was my own version of idolatry. That recognition and the confession of sin changed my entire life. Although there's always been a continuing tension between individual confidence, working harder than the next guy, and exerting control versus listening, as opposed to being uh, sensitive and leading others to a better solution. Well, your time here in Spring Arbor gives you the opportunity to fess up. Fess up that you need something else. Uh, it gives you time to gear up, to prepare for the, what's ahead of you. Now, gearing up, I, I, I ran into Reverend Van Valen this morning as I was driving in. He was coming in from his morning uh, jog, and, and I said, what's all this stuff going on out here in your driveway? And he said, oh, this is our gear up weekend. And I said, hey, that's the second point of what I'm going to talk about today. And he said, could you put in a plug for the church activities this weekend? So I, I have done it for, for him, so you can let him know. The term is derived from the military usage. It means get your equipment packed and be ready for your mission. The U.S. Department of Education even picked up on the term because the government, federal government, they can create an acronym for everything. So their program for grant monies to the states to gain early awareness and readiness for undergraduate programs. Gear up is their uh, acronym for, for, for the phrase. So at Spring Arbor, this is your time to gear up, to seek knowledge and wisdom and discernment and truth. Develop the armor of God for the challenges to come. Prepare effectively and robustly to engage in the contemporary world. Ephesians 6.4 says, Stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth and having put on the breast, breastplate of righteousness. Finally, after you fess up and gear up, you are ready for the critical participation in the contemporary world. The term man up, uh, it, it has a local colloquialism, but originally uh, came from the uh, oh, 1600s. It was a, a nautical term. It meant take your designated position on the ship, get to where you're going to do your work. Uh, it, uh, it was used as early as the 1400s to mean to, to staff appropriately, man up, get, get the resources necessary to get the job done. Fulfill your responsibilities despite insecurities. Be brave. Take responsibility for the consequence of your actions. Get in the game. Sometimes it's used as a challenge in military or sports uh, arenas. Go play tough man-to-man -man defense. Man up. Well, that's what I suggest you need to do to go out into the contemporary world. So what happened for me? I graduated from Spring Arbor in 1979. Went on to the University of Michigan Law School and continued uh, gearing up with the skill set that it would, I would need for that. And I joined a, what at that point was a was a fairly large firm based in Cleveland, Ohio. We had about 350 lawyers. Uh, I did uh, major environmental litigation. I helped start an environmental practice at a firm that grew from, I was the fourth person, and we grew to 45 environmental attorneys when I left in that firm. Uh, I was a trial lawyer, uh, and I can guarantee you as a trial lawyer, it is a difficult balance between that uh, confidence, arrogance, control, and winning side of the equation to sensitivity, listening, mediating, and resolving. Uh, my son said I should try share one lawyer joke with you at least today. So, so how many trial lawyers does it take to change a light bulb? 
And the, the answer is only one. He just holds it up and the world revolves around him. <laughs> So, I started that practice. It was highly lucrative. I had Fortune 100 clients. I was the environmental attorney for the city of Phoenix and all of their water development, air issues, litigation, largest cost recovery case in the country. Uh, I just developed a book, millions of dollars of, of business. And then I decided I wanted to reach out. And some people thought I was crazy, but I started to develop an international practice in Europe and Mexico. 1987. 1989, the Berlin Wall came down. One of my partners was uh, one of the U.S. congressmen who had, had tied the trade policies to the immigration policies in Central and Eastern Europe. And when the wall came down and it started breaking out, he urged us to get involved. We opened offices in Prague and Bratislava and Budapest and Kiev and, you know, and, and we were the first Western firm in there and I started working in Central Europe. I learned how to listen to what those cultures needed and try to help and, and just, just learn. Everywhere I went, I, I learned. I was getting a little bit out of my comfort zone, but I learned about new things. And I had a call from, from a friend who had a connection in the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago, and he, he said, hey, would you like to go down there and help them create an environmental agency and write envir environmental laws for them? And I said, wow, I've never done that, but it sounds interesting. So I flew down. And the United Nations hired me uh, for the government, and I was embedded in the government, and I learned a completely different culture. I, it was a commonwealth, a British commonwealth country, and it had uh, you know, a parliamentary system. And I was, I was elected as, as, as a Western, as a, the parliamentary draftsman for the country. And I was given a, a little uh, group of consultants to help me, the, the founding president, uh, Sir Ellis Clark, the former attorney general of the country, and the senior judge sitting on the bench at that time. And the three of them would get together with me, and I'd give them ideas, and they'd tell me why it would work, would, would or wouldn't work. And, and we changed the entire government structure in Trinidad and Tobago to a system that worked very well. Because of that, I was contacted out of the blue by uh, a company that had sold the Apache attack helicopters into, uh, for, for the first Iraq war, and they had an obligation to the United Arab Emirates to help them offset the, all of the money that that, that uh, country had spent on the helicopters, and they wanted to have the best environmental program in the world. And they heard that I, I did environmental programs. And they flew me over, and there we were. I was, I was embedded in the Arabian Gulf in the government. I didn't speak Arabic, and uh, a lot of the people around me didn't speak English, and we plotted forward. But I tried to be sensitive in the culture I was. Again, it's against my basic instinct sometimes, but I tried to listen more than talk for the first six months that I was there. Just hear what it was that needed to be done. And it came about in about September of that year was Ramadan. And as you know, Ramadan, there's it's 30 days of fasting in the, uh, in the, in the uh, Islamic faith. And, and, and the Minister of Health that I was working for came to me and said, you, we'll bring you water and tea and, and, and sandwich at lunch, you don't have to. And I said, no, I, I thought about it. I said, it's not inconsistent with my religion to fast. I said, I can, I can, I can respect your culture. And I spent 30 days where I didn't eat or drink until after the sun went down and I started getting invited to the, 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 the iftars to break the fast and I developed a relationship and suddenly everybody started to work with me. I, I, I listened and I adapted to somebody else's culture. I didn't dictate my own. And uh, after that had happened, I would, the Minister of Health trusted me and he said, you've got a meeting in Dubai tonight. Go over to the Japanese restaurant and, uh, and just sit, sit in there and the person you're meeting with will, will come. So I'm sitting in the restaurant. Again, this is a strict Islamic country and I'm sitting in the restaurant behind the paper wall, and the, and the door comes open, and one woman walks in, in, in the Arabaya, in her burqa, completely covered, door closes, and she starts to take the burqa off, and, the, and, and, and I said, wait, wait, there must be some mistake. I, you know, I'm gonna get in trouble. I thought I was being set up, I, frankly. I thought this was, you're gonna get in trouble and get thrown out of the country. She says, no, no, I said, uh, my father's one of the ruling sheikhs. I, I was educated in the West, and I've, I've traveled all over the world, and she was dressed impeccably in uh, you know, European fashion underneath the black robe and the face wrap. And she said, I just need to talk to somebody sometimes. And so she said, it's safe here. 
And so we spent about two hours just talking about world events and news and policy and religion. It, it was free-ranging. And then she got up and she, and she starts putting on the black draped robes and wrapping her head and putting the plate in front of her face. I said, I said, how can you do this? I said, you, you know the other. How can you wrap yourself up again? And she says, oh, don't worry. It's going to change soon. And, and she went away. Well, I went on to do other international projects, but when 9-11 hit, I was watching it live as it evolved on TV. I was in Phoenix at the time, and uh, it just had a mean, a, a, a bur put a burden on my heart to do something where I could make a difference. Uh, I understood the Arab culture. Uh, I, I knew it, so I thought, I went to my firm and I said, I want to start a Middle East initiative. And they said, go ahead, it's yours. So I took off, I passed off most of the lucrative U.S. environmental work that I had here to other, and the clients to others. And uh, in 2002, 2003, my wife and my son Jamie uh, relocated to Riyadh, Saudi Arabia with me. Uh, Jamie was going into his junior year of high school and he was a hockey player. What I, one thing I can tell you about Riyadh, there's not a lot of good ice. Uh, <laughs> but we persevered and uh, uh, and over the next decade, uh, we got to do some of the most fascinating projects in the, throughout the region, not just the UAE and Saudi Arabia, but Kuwait and Bahrain. I went into Iraq before there were even crossing points, accompanied by uh, you know, British military protection. Uh, we set up the first telecommunications for the U.S. Army in there. We repointed the Kuwaiti system and all kinds of interesting things. But I still had this memory of the woman wrapped in black that you know, had basically no civil rights in the UAE. And I thought, about it, and I thought you know, I really, I would really would like to change something else. And that was in 2004. So 2004, I took my, my summer vacation was going to Beirut and being put into an immersion Arabic program to be, learn to read and write and speak Arabic. And a 50-year-old mind is not as supple as a 20-year-old mind, I can guarantee it. It's a hard language to learn. But I did it so I could respect the people I was with. And I went back then, and I met with the Minister of Municipalities in, in Saudi Arabia to talk to him about uh, changing their electoral law system. Ultimately, I, I was retained to re write the electoral laws for Saudi Arabia. It wasn't my field of expertise. I just thought it needed to be done. And we, we created a system working with the, the ruling council of Saudi Arabia and the royalty. And it was finally uh, enacted. And we, we had great debates, but the law that was enacted was neutral as to gender, with the promise that women would be voting soon. But it took a little time. And I said, you know, it will really help if you make, push through some of these things. And they said, your suffrage took 80 years in the United States. You know, can't we have five? That was the question I was asked, and uh, so th they got five. But I'm happy to tell you that in, uh, in 2012, uh, uh, King Abdullah uh, made the polls open to women and elected positions open to women, and there's now a, a deputy minister of education is a woman in Saudi Arabia. Uh, I should back up a little bit. Uh, in 2004, right after I took that Arabic language program, I, I was invited to participate in the U.S. Arab Economic Forum. It was held in Detroit. It was a high-level diplomatic gathering, high security. And so it, it, the representatives from the United States included uh, you know, Colin Powell and the Secretary of Commerce and, and, and people at that level. We had royalty and ministers from, from uh, throughout the Gulf region and uh, the Arab world. And I walked into the meeting, I knew a few people uh, from Saudi Arabia and, and from the UAE, and I looked across the room, and here's this, this woman, she's striking looking, and I thought, I can't place her. And she turns and she starts running right to me, and her hand, the, her security people are like, Jason, where, what are you doing, what are you doing? She comes over, just and gives me a hug. This is so inappropriate <laughs> in front of her handlers to do that. And it was the woman I had uh, had the, uh, Japanese meal with nine years before. And she leaned over and whispered in my ear and said, see, I told you it was going to change. And I looked into, the, into the, the, the description of the people that were there. She was the CEO of one of the largest uh, corporations in the United Arab Emirates. 
and uh, no more rules, no more restrictions, freeing up. U the UAE today, I can, go to the, I can go to a Baptist church or a Catholic church or a Methodist church. They, they freely exist on the roads. Saudi Arabia, it's still restrictive, but it's coming around. Kuwait's uh, similar. The electoral law worked. The other concern uh, besides the elections in uh, the UAE was the, uh, um, you know, the transparency of the money structure, whether, whether Saudi money was flowing to terrorist organizations. And so the, uh, uh, the rulers in Saudi Arabia asked us to create a new uh, bank as an Islamic finance bank with complete Western level structural uh, uh, transparency. And we did that. Uh, we created, it was a, a you know, $1 billion uh, capitalization project. Uh, half of that was, a, 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 was an uh, IPO where local citizens could buy shares in the bank to get participation of local residents. 50% of the entire population of Saudi Arabia bought shares in our, our initial public offering. And it got people involved. The books are transparent. The bank is working well. Some of the other banks that had more difficulty not channeling their money the wrong direction were phased out. And, uh, and uh, I, I was just ex excited about the opportunity to have been there, to have understood a culture, and participate in, in the contemporary world. Over that time, my firm grew from, uh, from its smaller US base to 1,800 lawyers in 42 offices around the world. And uh, then it was time to take on another challenge. Uh, now this time you have at Spring Arbor, you can thoughtfully and thoroughly prepare for your critical participation in the contemporary world. Live your integration of faith and learning. Commit yourself to the value of every human being. Fess up to your weaknesses and incompleteness if Christ isn't in complete control of your life. Gear up for the challenges that lie ahead by seeking knowledge and wisdom and discernment and truth and the tools that are required to actively engage in the world. And be ready. Man up with Jesus Christ for the journey ahead. I've been very blessed to lead an exciting and rewarding life as I let God control and prepare the way for me. And I'm sure he'll do the same thing for you. Thank you very much. Dale, thank you for the great example of what critical participation can be and the challenge to all of us to keep that a priority and before us in, in the work that we do to help you as you head out from Spring Arbor and, and for some of you as you begin. The ceremony that we're about to go into, the lighting of the lamp of learning, symbolizes the beginning of the 1516 academic year. On the communion table before us is an oil lamp, representing the lamp of learning. We'll now be welcoming six members of our community who will help us ceremonially open the new year by lighting this lamp of learning. Two of the six are upperclassmen and the others are faculty from each of the university's four schools. As he preached to his disciples and followers on the mountain, Jesus said, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do men light a lamp and put it under a bushel, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. The light in this lamp of learning comes from the burning of oil. Throughout the Bible, oil is a symbol of God's presence, a sign of the Spirit of God. In the days of Moses, oil was used to anoint the head and beard of Aaron, the high priest, identifying the beginning of a ministry role where he would serve God on behalf of his people. In a Christian context, oil is often used to symbolize the Spirit of God who fills all believers directly. When we see God's Spirit as the source of our light, when we see one another as anointed of God, 
our respect for each other, our desire to work with and learn from each other are strengthened. This morning, the challenge for all of us is to enter once more into the Spring Arbor community of learners, but we welcome in a special way the new freshmen and transfer students as newcomers to our collegiate family. As we now close this service and leave this place of worship to learn and grow together, a representative of each Core 100 group, as well as a representative from our new transfer students, will now come forward and stand in the aisle in front of our institutional candle bearers at the foot of the altar. They will symbolically pass along the light from the lamp of learning to these new members of the Spring Arbor community, freshmen and transfers. See this as a sign that you too now are part of this community with the responsibility to share your light with all of us. Would you please stand and receive the benediction as given by our senior peer, peer advisor, Becca Bentz. Would you join me in prayer? Lord, as we approach this new semester and this year, we invite you to move and to work in our hearts and on this campus. As we dive into the new year, help us to allow you to be our focus and our perspective for learning and for how we live. Let us not be captivated by fear. Instead, let us live boldly and help us to be faithful to the proddings of your Holy Spirit. Help us to throw off everything that hinders us so that we can seek you wholeheartedly. Guard our hearts and our minds as we seek to learn, connect, serve, and grow. God, we thank you in advance for the amazing things that you're going to do in and through this university. Bless us now as we go from here and help us to be vessels for you and bring you honor and glory in everything that we do. It's in your name that we pray, amen. Please remain in your seats until the recessional. <laughs> 